So I'm Sarah. I've been um, Willow Weaving since 2008. Um, so I started just by going to the RHS show in Cardiff and someone was running a workshop. I was working at the time as an IT manager and I had been since, oh, I will tell you because then you might work out my age. Um, and I had to go in the RHS show at, at, at making a flower. And I couldn't believe that you could take a bundle of sticks that you could cut down from anywhere, even just a hedgerow and weave it into something that was pretty good, even if I said so myself. And um, I make it into something that was functional, that looked quite nice as well. So um, I got obsessed quite quickly and I booked myself on eight willow weaving courses within the next year. And I then bought a three and a half acres of pasture with my dad. And I planted about 2000 willow cuttings, I think it was initially. So that was within the first year. Um, I then set up my business in about 2012, I think. Um, and uh, so I was working full time and also running my business just to see if I could make it work. Um, and then in 2015, I had so much going on. I decided to quit my job. Um, so that was quite a big step. Um, and I've been five years now as a self-employed basket maker. Um, I'm also a coffin maker and uh, I dabble in sculpture, but I probably won't be continuing with that after the <laughs> most recent one. <laughs> so yeah, and that's how I, how I got into it really. Sarah, how did you, so you planted, um, you've got a field, you've got three acres yeah. and you've got, you grow your own willow which yeah. you use, and we can see behind you there, which is, is fantastic to yeah. see the varieties of stuff that you've got here. It's do, do you want to take us, through, um, <laughs> take us through planting willow? Um, so when do you yeah. plant it? When's the best time to plant it? How quickly so does I've it grow? Got... Um, when, yeah. when the best time to cut it is? I've got a little presentation. So I've got one. Here's one I made earlier. So I'll just share the screen so you can see this presentation because obviously I couldn't take you all up my field. Today, so I'll just, um, I can show you a little bit of, of what it is that I do. Um, so I hope you can all see this. Has that been successful? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. super. Yeah. So, um, so we've gone through all the, the Ask Me. That's some of the things that I do. Um, and also, um, like I said, I'm a coffin maker as well. So um, myself and my business partner, Melanie Bastia, make willow coffins. And um, there's some of the ones that I've made. Um, so, but this is how you plant willow. So I now grow 26 different varieties of willow. So there are around three to 400 varieties of willow. Um, not really? all are suitable for basketry. Really? Yeah, there's a lot of willow. <laughs> So, um, yeah, not all are suitable for basketry. So some grow as shrubs, um, weeping willows, like we would see at Roth Park in Cardiff, you know, hanging over a lake. They wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be suitable or flexible enough to weave a basketry. And also the trees been growing for such a long time, though they might be new branches, they wouldn't necessarily be supple enough for basketry and they would potentially just snap. Um, so I grow... Um, basket tree willow really essentially i do grow some other um larger willows uh for things like um sculpture quintess ribs i'll tell you more about that later on um and for living willow that you would plant in the ground to make into domes and arches um, but what you can see here so the picture on the top left is some of the varieties that i grow so like i said i, I grow 26 varieties and I grow them mainly for the height of them, but also for the colour. So you can see I've got browns, whites, yellows. Uh, they're beautiful when they're fresh, um, but they don't actually stay that colour, unfortunately. Some of them dry to be quite a different colour. So uh, willow is planted now. So um, it's planted in the winter months as a bare root cutting. So I would just cut a stick of willow down and then cut them into cuttings so they're about 30 centimeters long and you would put two thirds of that cutting into the ground and then leave a third sticking up so you can see in the top um the two pictures in the top right hand corner 
and the, the middle one is where I put it into the ground and the first leaves are appearing. The second one on the right hand side is the one that I cut it and they're the buds that are already starting to peak out as I call it in April. And um, so you plant, you can plant the willows between November and April and then they will start coming out in bud when the sap starts to rise. So you can see in the bottom left hand corner, um, that's called Leicestershire Dick. So I planted, that's 240 cuttings. And then the next picture along the bottom middle is actually probably just one month's growth. So uh, willow is extraordinarily fast growing plant. Um, in a year, for a common Aussie variety, you can get to 16 foot of growth just in one year. Um, I try and grow a little smaller. So for basketry, you would really want three foot, four foot and five foot rods. Um, unfortunately, because my land is pasture land and it has been fertilised in the past, I've owned it for 10 years, but I haven't fertilised it. It still grows incredibly rapidly. So some of my willows grow up to nine foot in just one year. And obviously I don't want to make a basket with a nine foot willow because the taller they get, the thicker they get at the base as well, which makes it hard to weave. You can still use them for other things. So this Leicestershire Dix variety that I've got on here does grow quite large, um, but I use it for frames. So you can always use it for something else um, if you can't use it to actually weave into the basket, if you see what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, any questions still before I move on to the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> so what's... Um, what's what the rate of growth? So it depends on the variety. So I've got a variety called Norbury which is great for if you want to do workshops with children and they can't, um, you know, use a really massive thick uh, willow rod. So the Norbury variety will grow up to three to four foot. So I know that I'll get four foot rods from that. Um, like I said, the common osteo grows up to 16 foot in a year. So it just depends on the variety as well. If I left all of those and I didn't cut them, they would be trees um, as well. So all of these will grow into 20 to 30 foot high trees. And I've left some of mine and they have, uh, they're, they're higher than the, my hedgerow now. So um, right. every one yes. of them has the opportunity to grow into a tree. Um, if you're going to plant them in your garden, you, they, they go, the roots go down and look for water. So you shouldn't plant it. If you're going to leave it to 30 foot, you need to plant it 45 foot away from your house. If you're going to cut it down every single year, then and you only get it six foot high, then you leave it nine foot away from your house. So it's a height and a half away from your house. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah so it, it, you've got to be quite careful about where you plant it. But obviously I'm on a field, so I've now got five acres. So I've got this growing, so I don't have to worry too much about that. So. But I'll show you the next so, slide as well. Go on, what were you going to say? There's a bit of a delay on the thing. Sorry, so if I interrupt you. Uh, that's okay. Uh, no, I just um, having been up to the field where you grow these, it's um, interesting to see the bundles that you've got around this. You've cut them, um, yeah. which is what, what time of year do you cut them, sir? So you cut them, you have to wait until the leaves drop off. So, so this is the next slide, basically. So the bit that I showed you on the previous slide where I planted it, that picture on the top left is actually that in full growth. So when it's fully grown, it's got leaves on it, it's lovely and green. And then come September, October time, the leaves start dropping off. So the sap will be going down in the plants. And so the leaves start to drop off as soon as all the leaves are off. and even in the 10 years that I've been growing willow, it's become later. So I used to be able to start cutting the willow at the um, beginning of November. And now it's, I've still got leaves on it now. So we're at the beginning of December. So for climate change, it has made a difference and that I am cutting the willow later. So as soon as the willow looks like the top right, 
um, picture with all the leaves gone, I can then start cutting it. I don't have to, that's got snow on it. I don't have to wait for the snow, thankfully, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I start cutting it when all the leaves have fallen off the sap down. So you can see the bottom left picture is when I've cut it. And then the bottom right picture is when I have bundled it. So that willow on the bottom right picture is all the same variety grown in the same field. But that is the range of heights that you may get um, from, from one variety, if you see what I mean. So I probably got there from three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, so between three foot and eight foot. Um, so yeah, from one cutting, when you first plant it, in the first year, you might only get three to four rods. Then in the second year, you cut it right back to the ground. The next year, you might get 10 to 15 then the next year you might get 20 to, to 30. And then ideally after five, uh, after three years, you'd probably be getting about 30 rods per cutting. Um, so you can see how many rods you need. A, a, a small basket would probably take up to a hundred rods. So you do need quite a few plants to be able to make just one basket. Um, I've got four and a half thousand okay. plants now. And that's actually not very many at all. That probably covers a little less than a third of an acre, actually. So um, you do need quite a lot of, of space and area to be able to, to grow enough willow to make a business, if you see what I mean. On, on, a, on an environmental side, yeah. the, so interested, um, with, there's a couple of things here in growing willow trees, which is one that you are creating um, an area on your land which is otherwise grazed, um, yeah. which has a, a wind buffer. The roots going down into the soil um, are aerating the soil and is creating um, a place where moisture. Uh, where water coming off um, heavy rainfall yeah. isn't sweeping yeah. down uh, the side of your field. Um, yeah. So there's, uh, there's a bit of a flood defence or a slowdown of water runoff that happens through that kind of planting. But the other thing is um, carbon sequestration as well, whereby you're, you have embodied carbon uh, within growing the willow yeah. and products that you make all are hold carbon so there's a there's a massive plus uh on an environmental side in yeah. growing the willow and making these kind of products and also for the wildlife um because um i always feel bad though when i cut them down because i've almost taken away their little hidey place within the willow as well which is a bit of a pity um and also when the when the willow starts to bud then in april of course is one of the first ones that attracts bees and butterflies for the for the nectar on the catkins as well not the catkins but you know the, the birds that come out um so i do actually leave some of the willows to go to bud um and become trees so that i've got them there for the for the butterflies and the bees and the hoverflies because i feel i feel quite guilty about cutting them all down sometimes so um and you know and this it, it's the beauty of willow it's such uh sustainable and it, it regenerates itself i every single year i haven't got bored of the fact that at the end of the cutting season i have nothing left there and then within a couple of weeks, I start getting leaves shooting out of all these sticks in the ground. It just, it still blows my mind. It's just, and I know, it, I still think it's bonkers. So um, yeah, and I cut all this at the moment. I cut it with secateurs and loppers. So I, I, it's hand cut. So it's a lot, it takes a long time. Do you sell your loans, sir? Yes, well, I sell at the moment I sell willow cuttings. Um, I have a, a crazy plan. I don't know whether I told you about this, Dylan, so I'll, I, I'll drop this one on you. Um, my The farmer offered my father the next field. Um, so my dad did actually buy another acre and a half and we were uh, stood there scratching our chins wondering what we're going to do with it. So we, we went through the list, you know, pigs. Should we get another horse? Um, should we put alpacas? And I'm like, hang on, why don't I just grow more willow? Um, 
so I spoke to a few people about it. I cannot um, possibly hand cut any more willow. So I started investigating how other people, uh, small growers cut their willow. So they use scythe mowers. Um, so I actually had a grant from the Heritage Craft Association and bought a scythe mower. Um, and I'm just about to plant up an acre, hopefully, this winter, using the willow that I grew okay. to populate this new field. Um, so that's going to be around 17,000 cuttings, I think you can get on one acre. Um, and then I will have willow bundles to be able to sell, because at the moment I'm using everything that, well, I've got a lot of willow around the place, but I'm using everything that I'm growing at the moment. So. Um, I do plan to do that. I am wondering about uh, whether it's a good idea. It's hard work and I'm not getting younger. Uh, so if anybody ever wants to volunteer cutting willow, <laughs> I'm available. Uh, okay, we've got a, maybe a project there for next year. <laughs> we'll talk get about this again. Get yeah. your water on your wellies and get down to Kavili. <laughs> that sounds great. Hey, how, so what's the... So having having cut them, what's yeah. the process between there and those bundles I can see and you, you start to actually next slide? It's almost like we rehearsed this still, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> like <those. laughs> so um yeah, so there's the willow preparation. So like I said, you can actually grow some of this willow for living willow, and that's that's my friend Melanie Bastia. We were working on a job that's in Abergavenny um museum on the left hand side there so you can plant willow into domes and arches and tunnels um, but you have to cut it every year that was probably about 30 foot in the air just with the pieces of willow growing out to the top so you almost have to cut it you have to cut it every year um, the bottom picture is the incredibly sophisticated way of bundling willow which is using a dustbin um, so you put all the willow, so all that willow I cut, I have to sort it all and grade it into height. So you use a dustbin and a measuring stick and you take everything that's between six and seven foot out of the dustbin and that's seven foot willow. Everything between five and six foot is a six foot willow. So that's, you know, the, the other, once you've cut it all, it hasn't finished there, you've then got to grade it. Um, and then you can see on the right hand side is my back garden actually and that's an eight foot long cattle trough and that's why I used to soak the willow uh, because once you've graded it you then um, have to leave it dry for three months so willow sucks up a lot of water it's got a lot of water within the rod so if I wove it into a basket and then it dries and all the water came out the basket would would not shrink and become smaller the weaving would just be looser, you see what I mean, and you'd be able yeah. to get yeah. through the weaving. So you have to leave the willow probably about three months to dry before you actually then re-soak oh. it to be able to make it pliable enough to weave. The willow never takes on as much water during the soaking process as it does when it's fresh. Um, you can actually steam them as well, so you can see to the right hand side of my of my soaking tank is a is a sewer pipe it was brand new when I bought it so it never been used um and that's eight foot long I can get two bundles of five foot end to end in it and I use a wallpaper stripper um to steam them I don't do that very often um I only do it really if the willow hasn't quite soaked enough and then you finish it off with the steaming and um, steaming tends to to change the colour of the willow to brown. So if you've got a lovely purple, bluey toned willow rod and you put it and steam it, it will probably go brown. Some of them do change colour, like a Flanders red variety, which is already a little bit orange, will go a darker orange colour. So you really have to experiment with it as well. Um, the willow that I use is brown willow. Um, and that takes longer to soak, which is usually a day for every foot of length is the rule. But that's if you've got kind of normal summer temperature water. The moment the water's got ice on it, it's the morning, so it takes a little bit longer to soak. So it is a long process. You know, you can't, um, Graham was talking on his stick chair on his stick um talk the other day that he can just pick his stick up and start carving again yeah. but with willow that's not quite the case you have to soak it 
brown willow anyway for a long period before you can get going um the di- there's different soaking t- times as well so just you know to throw a thing in there um so you've got brown willow which is on the left hand side of this um that can be any any willow with the bark left on so any willow with the bark left on whether it's purple bark yellow bark orange bark is all described as brown willow which is not not the best description um buff willow which is lighter i've actually got uh, i don't know what we can the colours it's like a lighter colour it's almost like a pinky colour um and it's the colour that they use mainly in in commercial baskets it's been boiled for 10 hours um and then stripped of the bark and the reason why they do that is because it's quicker to soak because it no longer has the bark on it so the buff willow will a five foot buff willow rod will take an hour and a half to soak, whereas a five foot brown willow rod will take five days to soak. So that's why in commercial basketry, you always see them made with buff willow. So now we go into construction of baskets then. So there are two real types of well, oh, there's lots, but um, I'll try and I'm not trying to freak you all out, really. Um, there's two real um, ways to construct a basket, and that is a stake and strand basket um, and also a frame basket. So a stake and strand basket, I don't know whether you can see behind me, my shopping basket. I've got one here as well. So, you can... so this is a stake and strand basket. So you can see the stakes and strands. Um, an example of a frame basket would be um, a trug. So you can see that it's got a preformed frame around it uh, with ribs. So I'm going to start on the stake and strand basket first. So how do you construct this basket? Let's hold it back this. Um, you always start with a base on a stake and strand basket. Um, so I'm not going to do I'm going to do a blue pizza. So I'm not actually going to going to make one live because that's just too stressful. Um, so this is a steak and strand. So I don't know whether you can see there that it has three rods going through the center and three rods going through um, yeah. through the opposite way. And that's how you start constructing this steak and strand. Now, what we the reason why we use three and three on this particular basket is because when you get out to this section out here where you're going to add your side stakes you want there to be about an inch to an inch and a half gap because your side weaving can't be any further away than that because it would be too loose so if i wanted to make a log basket which was this big I would then have to use more rods in the center because by the time I get out to here, uh, I still, you know, it's going to get more, more gappy. If you, am I explaining that? Okay. I, yes. I know yes. what I mean, but that's not helpful to you, is it? <laughs> but on this one, you can see that the base is a little bit larger. So I've actually used a four by four on that one. Um, so you can see why. I need to do that because that one is is quite a bit smaller than that one. Um, you then do something called tying in the slack. So I don't know whether you can see actually that there's two rows going around here, and that's called tying yeah. in the yeah. slack. And then you start opening out each individual stick then to um, space them equally. Um, and so. Just to re- reiterate to people what this will be recorded and we'll put it up on the YouTube channel. So um, if you're not catching things right now, you can uh, watch it again and stop it. And um, you can always go back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and go back on it. Yeah. So um, and, uh, here's that. A continuation of a of a base, so you just continue weaving. But you can see there the join. So this is this is a join. 
Sorry, um, Elizabeth, could, could you turn your mic off, uh, please? Oh, I think it is. Oh, no. I think, oh, yeah, I think it is now. So, yeah, you can see where you, so you join the willow together as well, because obviously parts of the willow, a willow rod is only so long, so you have to make joins. So you can see there the join. I'll tip it as well so you can see the, the yeah. sticking up part. On a basket mm -hmm. base, um, you always join the willow rod on the either the thick end together or the thin ends together. And that's because you don't want a, a step in your weaving. So you continue with the same thickness of rod, if you see what I mean. So it doesn't change from a, a thick to a thin rod. So that's why you would, um, yeah, so that was that was a, uh, a round base, but you can also use the same method with an oval. So you can see this yeah. is quite a large oval as well. So it's, okay. So yeah, you can see that you use the same technique on an oval, but you just for these pieces going through the centre, you just use long, longer pieces, if you see what I mean. Um, also yeah. on this base, yeah. I've done something called hidden joins. So you can see where it's on this one, um, you could see the joins on the top. So that's there. But on yeah. this one, uh, the joins are all hidden underneath. So they're they so you can just hold that steady. Steady. my hands are shaking <laughs> yeah so, so you can see all the joins on yeah, the one yeah. side which would be the underside of the basket but on the top when you're looking into your basket you won't see the joins so they're hidden joins um so yeah you can do those with with uh rounds or ovals so this is a basket i'll be making into an oval shopping basket so the next thing you would do now after this is to cut all these off to get them to be flush with the sides of the of the basket and then you have to decide whether um what shape your basket is going to be so i've uh, got a willow rod here so i don't know whether you can see that so you can see the flexibility on the rod um, and the, I would decide now on how I would cut this rod to insert it in the basket as to how I want the shape of my basket to be. So if I cut the willow rod on the back, like that, so I make a nice long cut, like that, Oof. and insert it into the basket. And I hold it like that, you can see that I'm going to have a rounded shaped basket. It's going to have a nice round okay. on it. If I put it on the other side, if I cut it on the opposite side, so it's now what we call on the belly of the rod, and I would kink it up, you can see that I'm going to have a straight sided basket. So depending on what side you cut the willow rod, is it depends on the shape of your basket. So you're always thinking about what's coming next on your basket as well. Um, so once I've done that, <laughs> yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're always thinking about what's coming next on the basket. Um, because initially when you've soaked your rods as well, you've got to think about colors and, you know, because, um, yeah, as you can see in this basket, it's not a very good camera on this laptop, I'm really sorry, but you can see there's a, a different in tone as well, just between the two colours, which really, which really makes it nice. And this is my own willows as well, so that, that makes it nicer that you've, you've grown a, it and made oh, it. That's a beautiful basket, Sarah. Aw, thanks. <laughs> so, but you can see... The weave um, is amazing. Oh, well, and this is what, yeah, I'm going to describe the weave to you next as well so you can see on the base if I hold it I don't know whether you can see where I've inserted the rods all the way down the sides as well so they become your side stakes so as I was inserting yeah. that rod just now so they are then turned up to become your side stakes all the way up the basket we then add yeah. something yeah. called a whale 
So this chunky bit down the bottom, which is more orange colored, is called a whale. And that really, you use that, it's spelled W-A-L-E. You use that to kind of set the spacing between your uprights, so your side stakes. And then you can decide what your block of weaving is going to be, what type of weave, because there's so many different weaves, it's unbelievable. And then you always finish the top then with another whale to set the shape again then. And then you turn the border down. So you can see the border is made of your, so all your side stakes here are then turned down and woven into be your border. Um, so, and it's, oh, look at that. It's not perfectly round, is it? Boo. <laughs> Which is a bit like, that's a bit like Hedgling. Oh, well, I have done a hedge lane course, actually. <laughs> yeah. Where, you know, you're, you're, you're yeah, either totally. bending or you're putting a cut in and, and folding the, yeah, the timber absolutely. over. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But um, the other thing I've learned over the years as well, and uh, various courses, I still go on courses with, with professional basket makers, is that the choice of material is key as well. Because not only in a willow bundle do you grade it for the height, and then before you're going to weave it, you grade it for the thickness of the willow rod as well. And this goes completely. So you're looking at the thickness of each rod within a bundle. So I would choose the, the thickest rods for the stakes, the thinner ones for the weaving, the medium ones for the whale, and then the thinner ones for the weaving again. But I want them, you know, you only get it to be so equal by being really pernickety with, with the thickness of rod that you're choosing so this weave I've got on this one is quite a new one um it's probably not but it's almost like it made a resurgence recently so this is a French rand so you would use um one rod for every single upright so on this one I, I don't I I can't ask this quickly um so you've got it denotes what you've got on the base denotes how many uprights you've got, denotes how many weavers you have as well, if you see what I mean. So the French rounds, I think it might be 32. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you, you can work out. Um, so you've got 32 weavers all at Just once. Always and always an even number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be, no. So if you did your base, so right. it, it depends on the base. If you've done your base four by five sticks, then that's how many uprights you're going to have, if you see what I mean. So it, it, it so even starting the base and selecting how many sticks you're going to have denotes your whole basket, if you see what I mean, and how many side sticks you're going to have, so how many weavers you're going to have. So no, it doesn't have to be. And on some of them, um, on some of the weaves, you need an odd number as well. So you would almost, when you're making your base then, you would put an extra bit in to be able to do something different, if you see what I mean. So again, oh, so many, so yeah. many iterations yeah. of what you can do, really. And you're, you're explaining the, the weave itself. Yeah, so with this one, it's a French rand, but you go one way with all 32 rods, and then you turn them round. So I don't know whether you can see that, you turn them round then and go in the opposite direction with all 32. Then you turn yeah, them round yeah. again and go the other way with all 32. So that's how you kind of get this zigzag effect going all the way up the side. And then uh, this is with single rods. So I think these were either four or five foot. So I can't remember now because it's quite a nice big block of weaving. But you're literally going back and forth with every mm. single bit. Uh, you can do it with double state, double weavers as well. And oh, it's beautiful, it's lovely. And then you can also <laughs> have a light color on the top and a dark on the bottom. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Oh, the, the options are endless. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that one. What, yeah. what is, yeah, it's indicative on. of um, this region. Um, yeah, I'd love, I've got. I'll show you one now. I've got a, but I've just realised it's buried at the bottom of my log basket. So I'll get that out now. I'll just show you this one. This is a French rand again. So it's exactly the same weave, but it's going in just one direction rather than back on itself. 
and I added some colour in. So you can see here, it started all the way around there. So I added some different colour stakes in there, and then that means that you can see the colour going all, all the way through, if you see what I mean. So it makes this right. lovely stripe colour. Right. I'll just get, um, I forgot that I'd had it buried, sorry. Not everything I'm so sorry. So um <laughs> this basket is um, it's falling now, isn't it? <laughs> that wasn't very organized. So this basket is um a traditional Welsh tea things basket. Um so you can see that it's still the same, it's made on a, a round base. This is my first one I ever made, so it's not perfect. So don't don't you know pick holes in it. So uh, it's got a little it's a traditional Welsh tea things basket. So um, you would put, you would have this um, placed on your Welsh dresser, Welsh dresser, and you'd have all your plates going round the outside, your best plates, which you want to just show off. And then you put all your cutlery in the little pod in the center. Um, and then That's you could nice. use this to carry That's your nice. plates to the table. Um, and then everybody would pick their plates out. But again, um, this is a traditional Welsh basket, but it's still using the same weave. So we're still using a French rand. So I don't think there's a particular weave that belongs to Wales, if you see what I mean, but there are particular baskets that belong to Wales. So yeah, that's a, a nice tradition, one, not round at all, my first one, so, so forgive me. <laughs> Um, oh, and I've got this one as well. I kept forgetting about this one. So this is one that I started but haven't finished. So this is a um, a fishing creole. Uh, so it's still again um, that's a French rand as well, but it's almost a um, a D shape with little I don't know if you can see that little feet on it yeah. as well, yeah. and and it gives. A, you know, a perfect example of how I'm going to turn the side stakes down to make the border as well. So, uh, yeah, with the little holes as well in the back. I don't know if you can see those. Um, and I'll put a leather yes. strap yes. on there as well. So that's another one on the to-do list, unfortunately. So, so, um, so this going back to this one again. So you can see because I haven't. So these are called handle liners. So you put these in if you want to handle right down at the weaving down here. So they're at the bottom because you can see there's a perfect example of what happens is it almost makes a gap in there because once I finished weaving, I then take them out and I put a bow in. So a completely solid piece of willow. And look at that. Here's what I made earlier. Come on. Oh, so I would use a really thick, so this is about a centimetre wide. So you can use a really thick willow then, and I would insert that all the way down. So you yeah. may ask why yeah. I don't do that in the beginning anyway, because sometimes I don't know how high the basket is going to be. And by the time I get to the top, then the handle, my, the handle bow might be too small. So you always put it in at the end, but it's a bit of a fight uh, to put it in, if you see what I mean. But the beauty of basket yeah, yeah. and then once you've got your handle bow in you would then wrap your willow around the handle bow to just dis to disguise it if you see what i mean uh let me get my other so there is that my this is my first handle i ever made so excuse me <laughs> so you can see that um there's a handle bow in here and then you would insert some willows going down and then wrap them round to disguise the handle bow. So I'd put, yeah. for example, on this yeah. basket, five in this side, five in the opposite side. And then they almost sit in between each other. And then you can, you can see this side, then you bring it to the inside and then bring it back out again. And then you do a nice pattern crisscross on the handle. And there's different patterns lovely, 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 the handle as well. Yeah, it's really nice and it's really strong as well. So it's really good. But I, I, you can see how much I put in this basket. You know, hand sanitizer. Um, 
So um, <laughs> I have actually replaced that handle because I've broken it already because I had all my weights and everything in there. So I did, um, I told you about frame baskets. So they're the other type of basket. So frame baskets are all made on formers. So um, these are some of my formers. So it's literally just a piece of kitchen worktop and they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. So um, some people put the willow onto the former when it's fresh and then you leave it for three months to dry on the former um, and then it will become like a solid shape, which makes it easier to weave with. It's great for beginners as well. Yeah. Um, I tend to use dried willow. I soak the willow and then wrap it around the former and put it in the oven because it's quicker. So I put it in the oven on 100 degrees for about 45 minutes and you've got a nice dry rod without having to wait three months. The beauty of the 21st century. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you've made a nice solid, um, a solid piece for that, and you can also then use the, the kind of um, edge of the former, like that, to make your ribs. Can you see the? Yeah. Yeah. So you use the edge of the former then to shape your ribs as well, um, and then the, you can start building it one here's another here's one i made earlier so you can see how you can let me put those down in a minute because i've got me on got everything everywhere uh. so for people starting out sarah would yeah. you say that this would be one of the simpler ones to uh, yeah i think at? so i i run this as a beginner's because i run willow weaving courses as well so i run this as a as a beginner's course because you've already set the shape, the shape is already hard. You don't have to worry about the shape of it. All you have to worry about is the weaving. So, so that's a really good like starter basket. Is there a and similarity then, between that and the coracle? Yes, well, yes, I suppose so. But you would make a coracle necessarily on a formal. Obviously, you'd be waiting donkey's years for that to dry. But you're still using the same kinds of shape. You're still using the same kinds of ribs. But I, I've never made a coracle, so I'm not sure. But I think they might use green. I don't really know. And then use the willow yeah, yeah. to set the shape. I not. Yeah. I, I don't know whether they use hazel as well for the ribs potentially in that. So. Um. But you can make. Those... But there's another one. I'm making this at the minute. Um. I think they used to call it hen's basket. Um, so yeah, you can see, but that's made mainly with with uh, frames and hoops as well. That's Just a dried on shape. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's a nice one. It's hard to weave it though. It's very fiddly. So love it, but drives me crazy at the minute. But yeah, I'll be finishing that today. <laughs> and then we got the piece de resistance, haven't we, Dale? Oh, we've um, been building so we've up got, to it. I know it's just like woo, our traditional Welsh basket um, called the Kintech. So it's a whopper. Um, I make them 18, 20, and 22 inches. So this is a 20 inch frame. So you can see it's massive willow as well, um, with the ribs in the center, four ribs that have been dried. So these do take three months because I can't fit them in my oven. I was considering buying an industrial sized oven, but that's just getting a bit ridiculous. So you can see how it starts though. I haven't tied them in at all. I use spacers as well, just to help me keep them apart. Um, and yeah. then oh. I have got one that's finished. So you can see it. So, oh, there goes my secretaries. Uh, so this is a finished one. I'll have to sit all the way back here. Yeah, um, that's, that's the next. So you can see, um, so you can see how, I haven't trimmed this at all, um, but you can see also over here, if I can put it a bit closer without, it will have their tied in initially as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I need to trim it and that's all using my own willow as well. So that's really, I'm really pleased with that. So. And can you give us just a little bit of historical background to that, Sarah? Um, they were used traditionally as an agricultural basket. So um, in the fields, collecting things 
um, from the field. So you would hold it here and then you'd be picking things and, and putting them in the basket. Um, in the 80s, in the early 80s, there was one person left making them called DJ David. Um, and he taught someone called... About? Pardon? Where, where about was he? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it must be Cardiff way, Cardiff Bridge End way, because he actually worked as the basket maker for St. Fagans. Um, so yeah, yeah he okay. was, he's, he's local to this area. Um, he used to make them with his father uh, and he was the only one left making them like anywhere. So he panicked about that and started teaching people. So he taught Les Llewellyn, um, who has now taught us. So I just bought one of Les's baskets as well. So you can see it's a whopper. Um, beautiful. So I can use wow. that almost, um, as a template as well. So this will be now my my basket. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so Les is just retiring as well as <laughs> just announced. So I had a bit of a panic. So um, yeah, I got him to make me a basket. So um, yeah, so there's there's quite a few people making them now. Les it was the only one only making the Kintesh though. So that's all he would make. Um, so we do dabble in Kintesh, but there's nobody left now which slowly makes them, if you see what I mean. But I will be, I'm hoping to teach courses on the Kintesh making shortly, but totally and there's a lot that we don't know anymore because that information has just been lost to generations you know of, of basket makers children that didn't become basket makers basically so St Fagans we went and we had a basket makers association meeting in St Fagans and they brought out some of the the baskets from the archives and there's so many baskets there it's unbelievable but they're not online to be searched so I'm interested in looking into that with my IT skills as well that might be quite handy but um I need to speak to them there's another lady as well from Bridgend who's looking into the history of baskets and she's done like the Gower cockle picking basket and things so there are different baskets out there I also there's uh the rural English life museum in Reading I went to as well for another basket makers association meeting and they've got the history of their baskets and how many baskets they've got there is just unbelievable and they've got them all online as well so you can search them and look at the pictures so it's just one person couldn't do it all it's just fascinating the history behind baskets it's amazing can you see the searches happening with uh, basket making and people wanting to buy baskets again for various reasons and because of everything that's happened this year and uh, global supply chains and environmental yeah. issues, it seems like uh, this is one of the most environmentally sustainable. If we purchase them from Willow that's grown in this country and people who make them in this country as well, that they are tools which we can, uh, we can keep, the, the sort of vessels which we're not going to throw away, or if we do eventually that they're you know, they, they can be recycled and they can uh, go into yeah. compost heaps or whatever. So could, could you see um, people sort of going back to using baskets? It depends on the person um, because I am the busiest I've ever been at the moment um, and I can't make enough for stock. Well, you know that, don't you? Um, yeah. But... Yeah. People still love cheap imports. They love getting a bargain, don't they? So there are people that wouldn't touch my baskets with a barge pole because they're too expensive. They'd rather go to a cheaper shop and buy one, it break in a year and throw it away. You're always going to have that. Now we've got this massive global supply chain, basically, where you can have people that will work for a pittance and people, unfortunately, that ex exploit them. Um, and people don't know where these things have come from, so they will buy them. But there are more people, and especially because of this year, and also for things that are going on with the environment and climate change and things David Attenborough is doing, you know, um, making people think about where they source their food and their, you know, their materials. So, yeah, I think more people are aware of it, and I'm really happy that it's happening. Um, but you're never going to get everybody that will that will care, unfortunately. No. But there are, it's probably, I would say about 
I will, I think 50-50 splits a bit pushing it, perhaps 70-30. <laughs>